A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 9th of April 2022. So these are the list of news articles chosen for today's discussion. If you can see we have five different news articles. Firstly we will be discussing about FCRA Act in detail. In the second news article we will be discussing about gaps in criminal justice and some of the guidelines given by Supreme Court with respect to criminal trials. Then in this following news article discussion, we will be seeing about CAA in prelims perspective. CAA is nothing but Citizenship Amendment Act. We will briefly see some of the provisions of CAA in this news article discussion. For the next discussion, I have chosen WCCB report. We will be seeing some of the important facts about WCCB in this news article discussion. And finally, we will end our news article discussion by discussing about food price index. Now, without wasting much time, let us move on to the first news article discussion. Look at these news articles. The news here is about the FCRA Act, that is Foreign Contribution Regulation Act. See, recently in 2020, the FCRA Act was amended. The changes brought about by the amendments were challenged in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, in its judgment yesterday, upheld the changes brought about by the 2020 amendment. These three news articles mention various clarifications given by the Supreme Court on why it upheld the Foreign Contribution Regulation Amendment Act 2020. This is about the news articles. So in this discussion, what we are going to do is this. We are going to first see some important features of the FCRA Act. Then we will look into the changes brought by the 2020 amendment. And finally, we will see the clarification given by the Supreme Court on why it upheld the amendment. This is the plan for this discussion. So just pay attention to the news article discussion. First, let us start the discussion by looking into some important features of the FCRA. See, as you know, the NGOs, they act as a link between the government and the people. Most of the NGOs help in bringing the government schemes to the grassroots. For example, consider the polio vaccination program. Various NGOs played a significant role along with the government in the polio vaccination and eventually making India polio free. So in a large country like India, the NGOs play a significant role. For NGOs to function, they need funding, right? Since they are most often not for profit organizations, they depend on donations for their day to day functioning. Donations can come from fellow Indian citizens, the Indian government, and in some cases from foreign countries also. Since India is a sovereign country, an unmonitored inflow of foreign funding could potentially work against India's sovereignty. So, the foreign funding for the NGOs are regulated. This is where the FCRA comes in. Only the NGOs registered under the FCRA can receive foreign funding. In a sense, FCRA, as the name suggests, helps in regulation of foreign funding. Now, what is the objective of FCRA? The main objective of FCRA is to prohibit acceptance and utilization of foreign contributions for any activities detrimental to national interest. In this regard, FCRA is meant to ensure two things. Firstly, the FCRA ensures that foreign contributions are received from legitimate sources. Secondly, the FCRA ensures that the received foreign contributions are utilized only for legitimate purposes. We should know that this act is an internal security legislation. So, despite being a law related to financial legislation, it falls into the purview of the Home Ministry and not the Reserve Bank of India, that is RBI or the Ministry of Finance. Have this basic understanding. FCRA Act is a internal security legislation and it falls into the purview of the Home Ministry. Now, having seen the objectives of the FCRA, now let us see what constitutes as foreign. See, according to Section 21H of the FCRA, foreign contributions mean the donation made by any foreign source to India. Remember that it does not include gifts for personal use. Also note that if the market value of such a gift at the time of gifting is more than the value specified by the central government for consideration as foreign contribution, then it will be considered as foreign contribution. Some other exceptions are educational fees and business transactions. 
if someone in india is receiving money to pay educational fee or to make business transactions then it is excluded from the regulation under fcra also know that contributions made by an nri from his personal savings through the normal banking channels are not treated as foreign contributions having seen what constitutes as foreign contribution now let us see who can actually receive foreign contributions under the fcra see any person or association can receive foreign contributions but there are certain conditions that must be satisfied firstly the person or the association must have a definite cultural economic educational religious or social program secondly the person or the association must obtain the fcra registration or prior permission from the central government finally the person or the association must not be prohibited under section 3 of the fcra 2010 so any person or association satisfying the above conditions is eligible for receiving foreign contribution in our country in addition to this information let us also see who cannot receive foreign contributions see section 3 1 of fcra defines the entities which are prohibited to receive foreign contributions it includes election candidates then correspondent columnist cartoonist editor owner printer or publisher of a registered newspaper then judge government servant or employee of any corporation or any other body controlled or owned by the government then members of any legislature political party or office bearers or organization of a political nature as may be specified by the central government finally association or company engaged in the production or broadcast of audio news or audio visual news or current affairs program through any electronic mode or any other electronic form so these are the entities that are prohibited from receiving foreign contribution according to section 31 of fcra having seen who can and who cannot receive foreign contributions now let us see to whom the fcra is applicable see as per section 12 of fcra the provisions of this act is applicable to the whole of india and citizens of india outside india it is also applicable to foreign branches and foreign subsidiaries of corporate bodies or companies that are incorporated or registered in india so far we have seen some of the basic features of the fcra now let us see the changes brought by the 2020 amendment first change is regarding who cannot receive foreign contributions just now we saw various persons who cannot receive foreign contributions under section 31 of fcra the amendment added one more person to the list the amendment added public servants to the list of persons who cannot receive foreign contributions now who are public servants see public servants include any person who is in service or paid by the government or remunerated by the government for the performance of any public duty so this is the first change the next change is regarding mandatory aadhar registration see there are two ways a person or an organization can receive foreign contributions the first way is for the organization to get registered under fcra the second way is for any organization that has no registration see these organizations that have no registration certificate can get prior permission from the central government the amendment made a change to the second way the amendment made it mandatory for the organization seeking prior permission to provide the aadhar number of all its office bearers directors or key functionaries as a identification document this is the second change brought about by the amendment moving on the next change is regarding the fcra bank account see earlier the organization receiving foreign contributions can maintain their account in any scheduled commercial banks of their choice the amendment made it mandatory for the ngos and recipients of foreign contributions to open a new fcra account at a specified branch of the state bank of india in new delhi as one point entry for foreign donations the specified branch here is the sansad mark branch of sbi after receiving the foreign contribution through this account the ngos may open more accounts in other banks for utilization of the contribution the amendment invalidated the use of the old fcra bank accounts maintained in other banks the next major change made by the amendment is regarding the transfer of foreign contributions see earlier before the amendment the organization receiving the foreign contribution can transfer the amount to another person or organization provided that the person or organization must also be registered to accept foreign contribution or has obtained prior 
permission under the act to obtain foreign contribution this was changed in the amendment the amendment prohibits the transfer of foreign contributions to any other person or organization even though they may be registered to accept foreign contributions so these are some of the major changes brought about by the 2020 amendment now let's come to the news articles and look at the clarifications given by the supreme court for upholding the amendment see the supreme court read down one of the provisions that is section 12a of the 2020 amendment act which mandated the production of other card for registration here read down means the supreme court ruled that section 12a is no longer valid because it has been proven to violate one or more rights except this the court validated all the changes made by the amendment apart from this the supreme court said that no one has a fundamental or absolute right to receive foreign contributions the supreme court said that free and uncontrolled inflow of foreign funds has the potential to impact the socio-economic structure and polity of the country the court also added that the amendment did not restrict the inflow of foreign contribution but regulated the inflow the opinion that unregulated inflow of foreign donations might give a wrong impression that our democratically elected government was incapable of looking after its own affairs and needs of its citizens so according to the Supreme Court regulation of foreign contribution is necessary the Supreme Court also said that the possibility of national polity being influenced by foreign contribution is globally recognized the court accepted the government view that the changes made by the amendment were mainly aimed to prevent democratic polity public institutions and public servants from being unduly influenced with the aid of foreign contribution or foreign hospitality. Then the Supreme Court said permitting inflow of foreign contribution which is a donation is a matter of policy of the state backed by law. So the government in its capacity has all the rights to even completely prohibit receipt of foreign donations. Finally, the court said the presence or inflow of foreign contribution in the country ought to be at the minimum level. The court added that charity can be found in our country itself. So the NGOs could look within our country for donors. So these are some of the statements given by the Supreme Court while upholding the validity of the 2020 amendment. Make note of all these points. You can use them as a value addition points in your main sense writing that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we first saw some of the important features of the fcra act then we looked into the changes brought by the 2020 amendment and finally we saw the clarification given by the supreme court on why it upheld the amendment so with these learn points now let us move on to the next news article discussion See this article here, it is an editorial article. It says that the Supreme Court of India, while hearing a criminal appeal, took so more to cognizance of certain deficiencies and inadequacies which occur during the course of criminal trials. And the Supreme Court has issued necessary directions and the guidelines regarding inadequacies and deficiencies in criminal traps versus the state of Andhra Pradesh 2021. So this is the crux of the editorial article given here. In this context, let us learn about the inadequacies and deficiencies in the criminal trials and the important points mentioned in the article regarding the guidelines. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this article is highlighted here for your reference. Just go through it. First of all, let us start the direction issued by the Supreme Court. See, in 2021, the Supreme Court issued guidelines for the deficiencies and inadequacies which occur during the course of criminal trials. And the directions include, firstly, presentation of a site plan, secondly, inquest report and body sketches in the post-mortem report in a uniform manner. Here, inquest means official inquiry to determine the cause of a person's death. So, the second direction is to have an inquest report and body sketches in the post-mortem report. Thirdly, photographs and videographs of a post-mortem in certain cases. And finally, separation of prosecution from the investigation. So, these are the directions issued by the Supreme Court. And as a result, the High Courts and the State Governments were asked to notify the draft rules of Criminal Practice 2021. So, accordingly, the Guwahati High Court issued the essential notification and incorporated the necessary changes in January 2022. So, this is the base of the editorial article given here. 
Having this as our foundation, let us see some of the important points that are mentioned in the editorial article. First, we'll start with the site plan. See, as per Criminal Procedure Code or CRPC, it is mandatory that the officer in charge of a police station shall proceed to the spot of the crime and they have to go in person to investigate the facts and circumstances of the case. This is on receiving information about the commission of an offence. See the general practice is that after reaching the spot, a site sketch should be prepared and it should show details of the crime scene and collect evidence which could connect the presence of the criminal. Now look at this image here. It is the hand drawn site sketch. It is just a rough drawing and the most important thing you have to remember is the content of the site map would not become an evidence just because they are exhibited by the investigating officer. But the guidelines issued now say that the site sketch prepared by the investigating officer shall be followed by a scaled site plan. And this scaled site plan should be prepared by a police draftman if possible or another authorized or nominated draftman by the state government. And citing the importance of site plan for solving a murder case, in this guidelines it is said that the police need to develop its own cadre of draftmen. And in this image here you can see how a scaled site plan of a crime scene looks like. It could be drawn only by a draftman. That's why the guideline actually suggests to develop police own cadre of draftsmen. So having done with the site plan, now let us see about the inquest report. See the purpose of preparing an inquest report is to confirm whether a person has died under suspicious circumstances or died an unnatural death. Remember if he or she is died an unnatural death, then the purpose of the inquest report is to find the nature of injuries and the apparent cause of the death. But if the evidence and materials collected during the inquest make it a prima facie case of any offence, then a criminal case will be registered and regular investigation will be taken up even without any formal complaint from anyone. See here also like side sketch, the contents of the inquest report can be treated as evidence. But remember, it can be only used to test the accuracy of the witnesses. See, if the investigating officer himself observes and records evidence, it is then treated as direct or primary evidence in the case and the best in the eyes of the law. Similarly, the postmortem report is a document which by itself is not a piece of substantive evidence. Substantive evidence is the evidence on the basis of which a fact is proved. See computerized bank records in a credit card fraud case, emails in a cyber stalking case and image files in a child pornography case are all substantive evidence. Likewise postmortem is the statement of the doctor in court which has the credibility of substantive evidence. Here the doctor's statement is only the substantive evidence. So here the postmortem report can only be used as an aid to refresh the memory of the doctor while giving evidence. See we saw that the Supreme Court has issued guidelines to impart body sketches in postmortem right. The National Human Rights Commission in Hachasi has already laid down similar guidelines for cases of deaths in police custody. So from this itself, we know how important it is to have body sketches that too in uniform format in an inquest report and a postmortem report. See, you should understand why it is important. The standardization will help the court to better scrutinize the evidence and it will also help the investigating officers and doctors to refresh their memory with more clarity. Having done with inquest report and body sketches in the postmortem report in a uniform manner, now let us see about the photographs and videographs of a postmortem in certain cases. See, Supreme Court has directed that in case of death in police custody, the magistrate or the investigating officer shall inform the hospital to arrange for photography and videography for conducting postmortem examination of the deceased. See, additionally, the implementation of the scheme of having trained photographers at police station is also underway and this is in accordance with Supreme Court's ruling of 2018 in Safi Muhammad 
versus the state of Himachal Pradesh. The draft code now provides that the investigating officer shall seize such photographs and videographs, preserve the original and obtain certificate under section 63B of the Indian Evidence Act 1872. And this section is regarding admissibility of electronic records. Now the purpose of these guidelines is to ensure that there is uniformity of procedure in dealing with cases of death in police custody without any tampering of evidence. And this is all about the standardization of body sketches in the inquest and post-mortem report. And finally about the investigation, see with regards to the investigation, the Supreme Court has further directed that the state governments shall appoint advocates other than public prosecutors to advise the investigating officer during investigation. See, this is because currently in many states, a public prosecutor advises the investigating officer to check and make up for any deficiency in investigation before submitting the charge sheet in the court. See, there has been conflicting judgments by the Supreme Court on this issue in R. Sarala v. T.S. Velu 2002 case. The court held that as per the scheme of the CRPC, the investigation ends with the formation of an opinion by the police. Supreme Court also held that it is the final step of investigation and this final step is to be taken by the police and by no other authority. Here the police prosecutor is an officer of the court and his role essentially is inside the court. But in the case State of Gujarat vs. Kishan Bai, which held in 2014, Supreme Court held that the prosecuting agency should apply its independent mind and rectify all the shortcomings and if necessary by requiring further investigation. This is because there are many lapses in investigation. See, investigation and prosecution are two different factors in the administration of criminal justice. So, the three judge bench of the Supreme Court has now rightly asked the state to separate the two wings. See, based on this, Chhattisgarh has sanctioned a cadre of law officers to assist the investigating officers in educating and improving investigation work and these law officers shall function independently of the public prosecutors and they will have no role in the court. See, this should be followed by other states also. Similarly, the creation of a cadre of draftsmen and photographers and videographers for certain cases should also be implemented to make the criminal justice system efficient. That's all you have to know about from this news article discussion. In this news article discussion, we saw about the Supreme Court's guidelines for the deficiencies and inadequacies which occur during the course of criminal trials. In that, we saw in detail about presentation of site plan, inquest report and body sketches in the post-mortem report in a uniform manner. Then we saw about photographs and videographs of a post-mortem in certain cases. And finally, we also saw in detail about separation of prosecution from the investigation. We also saw reasons for all these directions. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now take a look at this news article. See, this news article talks about the Citizenship Amendment Act 2019, that is CAA. See, this amendment act is in news because the Home Minister has sought another six months to frame the rules of the CAA. See, as of now, only the act has been enacted, but the rules under the act is yet to be framed. And without the rules being framed, the act cannot be implemented. So for this, as of now, the Home Ministry has sought time till October 9 to notify the rules. These rules will be published in the Gazette of India and after that the act will be brought into proper implementation. So this is the crux of the news article given here. Now let us utilize this opportunity to revise all the important points of the Citizenship Amendment Act 2019 or CAA which will be very useful for your preliminary examination. See as you know the Citizenship Amendment Bill it was passed by the Parliament in the year 2019. It received the consent from the president on the very next day, that is on December 12, 2019 itself. See, this move is nothing but an tool to amend the Citizenship Act 1955. Just remember this, since citizenship is an important topic, there might be a question regarding the facts which we are going to discuss in this news article discussion. So just pay attention to the discussion. Now let us look into some of the key provisions of the Citizenship Amendment Act 2019. See, according to the amendment, it said that 
the hindus sikhs buddhist jains parsis and christians from afghanistan bangladesh and pakistan who entered india on or before december 31st of 2014 will not be treated as illegal migrants now who are all meant as illegal migrants see an illegal migrant is a foreigner who either enters india illegally that is without valid travel documents like a visa and a passport also person who entered india legally but they stay beyond the time period permitted in their travel document are also called as illegal migrants note that an illegal migrant can be prosecuted in india and deported or imprisoned so this amendment actually says that the hindus sikhs buddhist jains parsis and christians from afghanistan bangladesh and pakistan who entered india on or before december 31st of 2014 will not be treated as a illegal migrants see most importantly the act does not apply to any other foreigners to be specific including muslims migrating to india from any country including afghanistan bangladesh and pakistan see secondly this amendment provides legal rights for the migrants whom i mentioned at the starting who are they yes you are right they are hindus sikhs buddhist jains parsis and christians from afghanistan bangladesh and pakistan so they will be provided legal right under this amendment also remember they get a faster route for indian citizenship through the naturalization mode how see the minimum residency requirement in india is 11 years for all other categories of foreigners but for these migrants whom we are talking about the minimum residency requirement in india is only 5 years by doing so they are getting a faster route for indian citizenship through the naturalization mode as well and the last but not the least important provision is that see the provisions under this amendment act shall not apply to tribal areas of assam meghalaya mizoram and tripura as included in the 6th schedule to the constitution also it is not applicable to the area covered under the inner line notified under the bengal eastern frontier regulation 1873 okay that's all you have to note about this amendment act we have to wait for the rules for the complete implementation of this citizenship amendment act 2019 So with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion Now take a look at this news article see this news article talks about the highlights of the WCCB report 2019 see the report has highlighted serious oversights on the Tamil Nadu forest department This is after investigating elephant poaching cases in a number of districts including the Nilgiris and Coimbatore See according to the report there is a mismatch between the cases filed and the actual crimes that has occurred thus the conservationist are demanding for an investigation by an independent team rather than a committee formed by the forest department itself so this is the crux of the news article given here today we are not going to get deep into this issue instead let us discuss some of the facts about WCCB or wildlife crime control bureau in prelims perspective See Wildlife Crime Control Bureau is a statutory multidisciplinary body under the Ministry of Environment Forest and Climate Change. Now how was it formed and when was it formed? See it was formed in 2007 under the provision of the Wildlife Protection Act 1972. See it was created considering the seriousness of organized wildlife crime and illegal trade of wildlife parts and products. Note that Wildlife Crime Control Bureau or WCCB is designated as nodal agency for sites related enforcement. Very important point. Make note of this. Also remember the bureau has its five regional offices at Delhi. Delhi is the headquarters. Then it has regional offices in Kolkata, Mumbai, Chennai and Jabalpur. Apart from this it has border units at Ramnadapuram, Gorakhpur, Motihari, Natula and Morey. Now let us see some of the mandates given to WCCB under the Wildlife Protection Act 1972. See one of its most important mandate is to collect and collate intelligence related to organized wildlife crime. Then it should do the same to state and other enforcement agencies so as to apprehend the criminals. Then it has a mandate to establish a centralized wildlife crime data bank. 
Apart from this, note that it also serves as coordinating agency. This is done by coordinating actions by various agencies in connection with the Wildlife Protection Act. Remember, they also serve as intelligent agency. This is done by assisting international organizations and foreign authorities. This will in turn facilitate wildlife crime control. See, one of the major role of WCCB is capacity building of the wildlife crime enforcement agencies. They also assist state governments to ensure success in prosecutions related to wildlife crimes and they are mandated to advise the government of India on issues related to wildlife crimes. Apart from this, it also assists and advises the customs authorities in inspection of the consignments of flora and fauna as per the provisions of Wildlife Protection Act, sites and exim policy governing such an item. So these are some of the important points that you have to make note of WCCB. WCCB is a statutory multidisciplinary body under the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. It was formed in 2007 under the provisions of the Wildlife Protection Act 1972. And most importantly, it was created considering the seriousness of organized wildlife crime and illegal trade of wildlife parts and products. And most important thing to remember about WCCB is they are designated as nodal agency for sites related enforcement. Then we saw some of the WCCB specific mandates under the Wildlife Protection Act 1972. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now for our final discussion, let us take up this news article. See this news article talks about the food price index released by the Food and Agriculture Organization. That is FAO. See world food prices jumped to a new record high. This is due to the war in Ukraine. Also FAO said that this price rise might trigger a global jump in global malnutrition as well. This is because Russia and Ukraine are major exporters of wheat, corn, barley and sunflower oil through the Black Sea. See, these are stable grains and edible oils, right? Hence, their style might cause price rise in markets, which in turn will cause rise in malnutrition as well. So, this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us discuss about the food price index released by FAO in prelims perspective. See, Food Price Index or FPI is released by the FAO, that is Food and Agricultural Organization. Hence, it is also abbreviated as FFPI, meaning FAO's Food Price Index. See, this index is nothing but a measure of the change in international prices of a basket of food commodities. The change here is taken on monthly basis. Have this basic understanding. Nextly, it actually consists of average of five commodity group price indices. What are the commodities? The five commodities are meat, dairy, vegetable oil, cereals and sugar. Here for the calculation, the average export shares of each of these five groups are also taken. Just look at this image given here. You can see that the average FPI is 159.3 points in March 2022. Thus, the food price index has made a gained leap to a new highest level since its inception in 1990. So, this is how the FPI calculation is illustrated to help the government of several countries to formulate their national policy accordingly. Now, who is this FAO? See, Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, is a specialized agency of the United Nations. Their aim is to make international efforts to defeat hunger. Remember, it was established in 1945. Its headquarters is in Rome, Italy. See, it was founded with a goal to provide food security for everyone. Also, its aim is to ensure that people will have access to high quality food in sufficient quantities. This is to achieve a healthy lifestyle. Apart from this, the FAO also brings out a number of publications or reports, some of which are the state of the world, fisheries and aquaculture, the state of food security and nutrition in the world, the state of agricultural commodities market, the state of food and agriculture, the state of world's forest, etc. So with this, we came to the end of this news article discussion. In this news article discussion, we specifically saw about food price index. Then we saw about FAO in prelims perspective. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next part of the news article discussion, which is nothing but the preliminary practice questions. 
Now look at this first question. This question is about Citizenship Amendment Act. Consider the following statements with reference to Citizenship Amendment Act CAA 2019. Statement 1. Muslims from Pakistan, Bangladesh and Afghanistan can never get Indian citizenship. Statement 2. Illegal Muslim immigrants from Pakistan, Bangladesh and Afghanistan will be deported under the CAA. Which of the above statements is or or correct? Option A 1 only, Option B 2 only, Option C both 1 and 2 and Option D neither 1 nor 2. See the correct answer for the question is neither 1 nor 2 because statement 1 is incorrect. See the present legal process of acquiring Indian citizenship by any foreigner of any category through naturalization that is under section 6 of the Citizenship Act or through registration that is section 5 of the Act stays optional. Hence the Citizenship Amendment Act does not actually amend or alter it in any manner. So the first statement is an extreme statement and it is also incorrect. Now moving on to the second statement, second statement is also incorrect because CAA has absolutely nothing to do with the deportation of any foreigner from India. The deportation process of any foreigner irrespective of his religion or country is implemented as per the mandate of the Foreigner Act 1946 under or the Passport Entry into India Act 1920. And as we saw in our discussion today, the rules for the CAA is yet to be formulated. So we have to wait for the rules for proper implementation of this CAA Act. Now moving on to the second question. This question is about WCCB. Consider the following statements with reference to the Wildlife Crime Control Bureau or WCCB. First statement, they can conduct a joint raid with Forest Division of any state. Second statement, it is a statutory body. Which of the statements given above is or or correct? Option A 1 only, Option B 2 only, Option C both 1 and 2 and Option D neither 1 nor 2. See the correct answer for the question is Option C both 1 and 2. Here both the questions given here are correct. Yes first statement is correct because they can conduct a joint raid with forest division of any state. And second statement is also correct as we saw in the news article discussion itself it is a statutory body created under the WPA Act of 1972. Now moving on to the final prelims question of today's discussion. This question is about FAO which among the following reports are released by Food and Agricultural Organization that is FAO. Statement 1 Food Price Index, Statement 2 Global Hunger Index, Statement 3 State of the World Fisheries and Aquaculture and statement 4 state of the world's forest see to answer this question if you know global hunger index is a peer review annual report jointly published by concern worldwide and wealth hunger health then you can easily arrive at the answer option a 1 3 and 4 only the main questions for today's discussion are displayed here go through the question write an answer and post it in the comment section with this we came to the end of the news article discussion if you like the video, do like, comment and share and don't forget to subscribe Shankaraya's Academy YouTube channel. Thank you.